Episode 30, Sacrificing Right Now. Welcome in. Today, we are performing a sacrifice. Gather around, gather around. Pause for a while. Pause for a while. Tonight, we are sacrificing right now. Right now in its luscious elegance. Right now is before you. Your mind holds a double-edged sword, one broad side of the past, the other side of the future. The blade. So razor sharp, it slices through the flesh of the now. Blood in the eyes. You can't even see the right now that is before you. It bleeds out and dries up, rots on the ledge, onto the next. When asked the question, what real world problem do NFTs solve? And the answer I always come up with is proof of digital identity. And just a quick note. Um, yes, the NFT space is weird and there are a lot of people trying to take advantage of others just that just as there are now in all of the online space. It's filled with scammers. And admittedly, there are many in the NFT space that are so far gone, they have escaped reality entirely. They live full time in this space. You know, they get their groceries delivered and don't talk to anyone face to face. Um, and they have this fantastical view without realizing it because this way of living has become normalized for the past three years. And they just think this is a way of living for everybody, um, that everyone can just do this. And that is not a current reality. And for them, you know, it's how they've been living the past three years and most likely going to be like that for the foreseeable future. With that said, I do think they're, is this underlying technology of proving ownership over a digital item. Whether it be a profile picture or an art piece that you post, um, that proof of ownership is going to be of value going forward in a more digital world. And with the rise of more software that can auto-generate posts, steal images, and misuse them, and you think of how much information we put online into various websites. And right now you have to quickly, you know, solve a little puzzle or, you know, what image shows a crosswalk or a stoplight. You have to prove that you're a human. These quizzes are going to get more intricate. Um, and there's going to be more intricate ways of proving identity. You know, we're already seeing two-factor authentication. Um, that's only going to be more prevalent and it's got to be tougher to, to prove your identity. Um, and one way that is going to be done is through blockchain technology. And you're starting to see that more and more with the moves. Centralized banks and more traditional banks are creating their own blockchains and using their own tokens like the stablecoin PayPal released this week. You look on their website, PayPal USD, PI USD, PY USD. As it says on their website, introducing the new cryptocurrency, PayPal USD, PI USD. It's a stablecoin backed by secure and highly liquid assets. As Pi USD rolls out, you'll be able to buy, sell, hold, and transfer it in our app or on our site. 
So with moves like that, and as banking becomes more digital, it's just an app on your phone, um, it's going to be more important to verify payments and have a public history that lives forever on the blockchain for people to be able to go back and see that payment as just one example. And it will be especially important with charities to make sure they are spending the money the way they say they're spending it. The public will be able to see all of the transactions they make as it will be public information on the blockchain. You can see the funds in their wallet and see what wallets they send money to and be held accountable for those transactions. And as with any new technology, you know, comes new ways to prey on people and people will always be people. Uh, but to say all of cryptocurrency is a scam is ignorantly dismissive. You know, how many s scams exist now? I was scammed a couple of years ago and it took me a while to not only get over it financially, but mentally. I felt like an idiot. And, you know, hindsight's always 2020. I definitely should have seen all of the red flags. You know, I let my guard down for just a minute, trusting someone through a freelance work site. Um, it's just wherever there's a chance to make a quick buck, scammers will be there. Uh, it was a tough lesson learned, learned the hard way. And it, it made me learn a lot, you know, in various ways did I learn something and one of those was realizing how much my bank does not give a single fuck that I was scammed. They did nothing for me. Absolutely nothing. And that in that experience was what hurt the most. Like a scammer is going to scam. Sure. But I had called my bank ahead of time because I was suspicious, you know, and that's also on me. And I do take responsibility for what I did. I am not placing all of the blame on the bank, but they did not have my back in this. And that is what hurt because I called ahead of time and talked to someone on the phone and told them I was suspicious of this check to please verify it. The next day, the funds were fun, you know, put in the account and they cleared the check and then they took it back uh, like a week later or something like that. It was like a week or 10 days later and took the funds back and it was just devastating. You know, thought the deposit hit that we were good. Because why would a fraudulent check be deposited? <laughs> um, and I was just wrong. I was so wrong to to be trusting in that that person to give me a good check. Um, but bank had no remorse. They said they were obligated to deposit the money within forty eight hours, and that they had up to thirty days to revoke the check. Crazy. But I was devastated i was unbelievably upset and hurt and i was so hard on myself during this time and just in disbelief that it happened i was sick to my stomach and it's really just it still stings to talk about it even now but just it made me look at banking even differently than i did and i'd already had a pretty negative view seeing what happened um in 2008 um when they purposely manipulated the system broke it and then asked for a bailout and when the ceos of the banks went to testify before congress they were asked if they were willing to give up their private jet to save their company and none of them said yes and they were bailed out anyway why because that is what they bribe politicians for. I mean, lobby. In America, bribing is called lobbying, and it's perfectly legal because, of course, it is. We're supposed to worship money and nothing else. This is the way. They spit on starving children to sell oil and coal and a rope to hang you with.
You can have whatever you want, do whatever you please. And if you are so blatant and commit so many crimes, no other American would think of committing. When would best suit you to be arraigned, sir? When does it best fit your schedule? We will treat you the best way we can. Of course, there won't be handcuffs or a fingerprint or mugshot, nothing to make you look bad. We have to worship you because you are perceived as rich and we must worship that. I started to look at alternate ways of banking. Who says centralized banks have to be the way we live our life? You see banks and credit cards being constantly advertised to, constantly programmed, commercialized programming have to keep people buying more and more and more and more. They are only good to the system as long as they are consuming. They can be mindless in their consumption. That part we really don't give a shit about. Just ramping up the violence, turning up the violence. One degree every year may turn one degree up about every six months now. Militarizing the police. Can't use tear gas in war as it's a war crime to use tear gas, but on your own citizens, yes, we can certainly use tear gas. Tear gas the ever living fuck out of them. How dare they question our monopoly on violence? We can kill for profit and for a disguised motive. They cannot. We know they don't have weapons of mass destruction. We're going to invade anyway. What is anyone else going to do about it? The UN says no. We are the only country sadistic enough to use a nuclear bomb on another country and willing to do it again at a moment's notice. All. One has to do is call the order for it to be done. And for 48 hours, no one by law can stop the president from doing that. Everything is everything. Six degrees of Kevin Bacon. Connect one thing to the next, to the next, to the next. Um, Go off on these random tangents. Start from one source. Go to the next, to the next. You know, with this podcast and however different ways and areas I go down. I try to always connect it from a place of creative, emotional intelligence. And I try to do that in so many different angles. And it's all from personal experience and an experience that I'm still working on. It's uh, not to come at this like I've climbed over these mountains in the past and have nothing left to climb. We will all die with flaws, a flawless death, a painless death from one form of life to the next. When I go, what part of me will be left? Death of a thousand arrows, death of a thousand flaws. Where did it all go wrong? When I was young at play, days were long. Where have all your childhood friends gone? I try to remember that last day we all played, but I can't. There was one day we were all playing together. None of us knowing it would be our last. Even today, a shadow is cast. A time I will never get back. Back to the first question about digital ownership and identity through non-fungible tokens, NFTs. We already have a digital trail if you have a bank account, if you've ever flown on a plane or rented a car. It's quickly become a staple of our society. NFTs and cryptocurrencies are taking that to the next level through a similar approach. It's the next step in technology. And... I just implore others to learn about it now so they can familiarize themselves with it and at least know how it works and why it's important, ever more so now with the rise of artificial 
intelligence and artificially intelligent software programs. As a creative, we're in a real renaissance right now with all of these new tools being developed. It's hard not to bring it up almost every episode. Like anything new, it's been divisive and I'm sure there may be listeners who hate it and don't want to hear any more about it, but I adhere to the growth mindset and think we need to adapt to an ever in changing environment, whether this environment be physical or virtual, which leads to my second question. Stemming from the first one where I asked at the beginning of the episode, what real world problem does virtual reality solve? And it brings people together when they physically can't be near one another, especially during a major event like a concert, an art gallery event, a museum. How many can actually go there? How many can actually go to the Louvre? What if you could virtually go there? Would that make it more accessible? You could still charge a fee to visit. Sure. Same thing for amusement parks. We'll most certainly see virtual amusement parks and experiences. You're already seeing some pop up. The tech is still relatively new, but the pace at which it's getting better is faster than any technology that has preceded it. Just look at iPhones and how fast they have gotten better in the past decade. And taking a, a bird's eye view, it feels like those inside Web3, the Web3 space already think it's not going fast enough. And those outside of the Web3 space think it's happening too fast. It's uh, interesting to see the, the differing narratives. And having been a part of the Web3 space the past few years and how it's 24-7 doesn't recognize any time off, no holidays. People are trading and making trades every second of every day. This isn't the stock market where it's Monday through Friday at a set time. No, it is right now and right now is incessant. What the fuck is a Friday? What does that mean? When did we go from day, 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 day? day to saying, okay, there are seven different days. They all have names and meanings for which we are going to tell you what you should do on those days. Those will be defined by your local society. So follow what they do and do this for generations to the point that it becomes quote unquote normal. And people start planning these days out. They start deploying destination happiness outside of right now. Right now becomes, ah, just let me get through this and I'll be happy. Let me get to Saturday and I'll have a good time then. And you're not enjoying right now. You hate your job. Oh, everybody does. No, they don't. Who is everybody? Have you been to every single country and talk to the over 8 billion people living on this planet. How many languages do you speak? How many countries have you visited? What's stopping you? These walls, these barriers, trying to live and do as you wish is not easy. I keep trying and I keep trying. Nothing ever feels like it's enough. Grinding every day, waking up every single day with bliss on my mind for over a decade now. And it still feels like it's not at the level I expected it to be. Turning 30 was hard as I had so many expectations of myself on what I wanted to have accomplished by that time. I wanted to be on the time 30 under 30 cover. I even photoshopped myself on uh, one of the issues of the 100 most influential people. I've seen the video of Jim Carrey a million times saying how he wrote himself a check for $10 million and put a date on it and actually achieved that. I watched as my check expired. I gave myself a time and it passed. <sighs> Turning 33 has been even weirder. Where have the past 
three years gone. They say you don't fail until you quit. I keep showing up. I keep showing up. I keep fucking showing up. And it feels like it's been blissfully ignored. If no one else shows up, then it's for my legacy. Something to leave behind. It's tough balancing what you want to do versus what you have to do. Obligations that you have to fulfill. And finding that balance Sacrificing right now. Friday, Saturday, Monday. There's only right now. I try my best to focus on that. The step am I on? I ask myself, am I happy right now? Am I feeling fulfilled? Am I able to pay for a roof over my head? If I sacrifice this for that, what will happen? If I say yes to that, then I will have to say no to that. Then what? What's the worst that can happen? No, what's the best that can happen? If the worst thing I can think of happens to me, the biggest fear I have, if that happens, then what? If I don't die, then I have to figure it out. I figured out shit in the past and I'm still here. And as long as I'm still here, I'll not quit until my fragile heart dies. And if this is my last episode ever, and one of those times that will be true, So I want to say it now, because if not now, when? But I just want to say, before I go, one last thing. And if it's the last thing I ever say, I want it to be this. Appreciate you listening. Be sure to hit the like button, leave a comment, and share. It's a free way to pay it forward. You can always go further at Bleece.com and sign up to our free newsletter. Let's go further together, one step at a time.